finish what I have on my heart this morning. I have another thought on my heart for tonight that I believe will be a blessing. And uh, I want to share, share that with you. I don't apologize, but in my heart for the last eight or ten days, I have been uh, <clears throat> dwelling on the thought of God's mercy. And I guess it was Friday, I began to wonder about something. And uh, I began to wonder about the first mention of the word mercy in the word of God. I did not know where it was. I just began to wonder about it. So I, I had my little table set up in the building and place where I can look things up and study some books and a comfortable chair to sit in, refrigerator with some water in it. Amen. Amen. I'm blessed. And a good cook just down at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, I began to look it up and it amazed me where that you find within three verses the first mention of the word merciful and the first mention of the word mercy. And you know what it has to do with? It has to do with the story of Lot. It has to do with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and their destruction. And I want you to know the same God that was merciful in Genesis chapter number 19 is still merciful today. I thank God for his mercy. Let's begin reading. I'll be in the entire chapter probably before it's over with, but what I'd like to do is, is begin reading. Um, I guess we'll read in verse 13 down through probably verse uh, 17. The word of God said, for we will destroy this place. This was two angels that had come. Most believe that it's the same two angels that appeared with the Lord unto Abraham just a chapter prior there in the door of Abraham's tent. We will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Are you all aware that this earth is reserved unto fire, unto destruction? There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Some don't believe that. One preacher said they have a right to be wrong. Amen. But you can mark this down. This world's going to be destroyed, not with a flood, but this time with a fire. The Bible said the rocks will melt with fervent heat. I don't know, scientifically speaking, I remember Olivia telling me, Papaw, I have a scientific brain. She told me that when she was three years old. She might know, amen. I don't know how much heat it takes to melt a rock, but it takes a lot. And I'm going to tell you something right now. The word of God said our God is a consuming fire. Notice what the Bible said here. The cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. <clears throat> and Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and uh, said, by the way, let me clear something up right there. If you, if you look just back a few verses, Lot, and we'll be talking about this a little bit, he is offering the wicked men of Sodom his daughters in the place of the two angels. And he said they've never known a man. Well, then you come down here and it says they were married. You, what you need to understand is in the Old Testament economy, the, the, uh, I guess the, the teaching or the theme of being betrothed to someone. In other words, the, the marriage had not been finalized as of yet or consummated as of yet, but they were betrothed to these men. In other words, they hadn't known them in a sexual way, but they were to be given in marriage. So that's why the Bible could say, which married his daughters and said, up, get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Wouldn't it be bad to be in such a place? I'm a dad, a husband, a papa, a pastor. Wouldn't it be bad for the words to roll off of my lips and for somebody that I know, for it to sound like 
I'm just mocking. I'm telling you, it'd be pitiful. I'll mention that word a little later. The word of God said here, he seemed as one that mocked his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful, that's the first mention of the word merciful in the word of God, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O oh, not so, my Lord. Look at verse 19, please. Behold now thy servant uh, that hath found grace in thy sight. Here's the first mention of the word mercy in the word of God. Thou hast magnified thy mercy which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Let's pray together. And I want to bring a message entitled, Mercy Magnified. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would clothe us in our calling today. God, that we would be encouraged in our spirits today. And Father, that you would help us to be a help to our people. Father, I realize this morning that there are very few in the world today, very few that are dedicated to the cause of Christ. I pray, God, for these that are gathered in our hearing this morning, that each one of us would find ourselves, our Father, not in a lukewarm state, but in a state, our Lord, where we're dedicated in these last days. Lord, help us, I pray, and God will give you glory. Show mercy, our Father, this morning to that one that stands in need of mercy, and God will give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As I think about what the Lord has put in my heart, and like Wednesday night, I'll, I'll be continuing next Wednesday night what we started last Wednesday night. But as I think about what the Lord has put in my heart, it just, my heart is just so full with this subject of mercy. The Bible said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And we studied last week about the man that he owed $12 million plus in today's economy. And another man owed much less, which would be about a third of a year's wages. He was forgiven his debt and then refused to forgive the other man his debt. Today, when the Bible says, thou hast magnified thy mercy, I thought about something. This, this past week, I had been, uh, many of you men probably have a set somewhere of Allen wrenches, and uh, I'd been doing different things, and I had these little bits that go in a screwdriver type thing scattered out all over the uh, bench. And my son got me this set for Christmas, and and generally with me, sets don't last very long. They're like keys, amen. I I, I lose the one I need the most, amen. But anyway, I've been trying, Brother Steve, with a passion to keep them together. And I got to looking to see what went in what slot. There, some of them are metric and some of them are uh, standard. And I couldn't read the little numbers. Anybody got a problem like that, even though I have glasses on? So I went over to the uh, toolbox, and I, I thought I'd seen one. I had a magnifying glass. And I, I went and got the magnifying glass, and I started holding them up. And you know what that magnifying glass did? It took something that, with my natural sight, was little, and it made it big till I could see it. If our Lord Jesus this morning 
were to take his mercy and magnify it in your heart and make it big. It bless you today. If you're saved, it would bless you. And if you're not saved, it would bless you to know how much God wants to show mercy to you. Not only does the magnifying take something small and make it big, but I have several rifles that I like to shoot. I don't shoot them much anymore. And, uh, but anyway, what you get with magnification is you take something that's far off with a scope or a telescope like looking at the stars. I don't have one of those. I'm amazed enough by those just looking at them through my glasses. Say amen. God's knocking holes in the darkness. But anyway, you take something that's afar off and make it appear to be close. Amen. And God's mercy may seem like this morning to someone it's afar off. But I'll promise you this. If the Holy Spirit will visit with you this morning, he can take that that seems like it's way out yonder and bring it all the way down here into your heart and your life. How many remembers when God did that for you? And you realized I'm the sinner he said I was. And he offers mercy just like he said he did. Amen. I want to give you three things that are in my heart today. And I'll try to hurry along. First of all, this mercy is magnified. I see that someone was praying. If you back up into chapter number 18, and I'm not going to go through all of the reading, but Abraham was concerned. When he found out that Sodom was going to be destroyed, he asked these uh, men, he asked the Lord, he said, would you destroy it for 50's sake? Would you destroy it for 45's sake? Would you destroy it for 40? Would you destroy it for uh, 30? Would you destroy it for 20? Would you destroy it for 10? And, it gets, and God said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. I'm telling you, beloved, Abraham was an intercessor. And in these last of these last days, we'll see more mercy being magnified when we see more of God's people praying and getting a hold of God. Amen. I'm going to tell you something right now, beloved. Listen, I thank God. You can read your Bible. Abraham would move, but one thing was always there. He built an altar. He knew he couldn't make it. It didn't matter where he was in this world. He couldn't make it without a relationship with God. He built an altar. I don't know about you, but I know that today, Lot knows that Abraham was praying. Amen. And Lot is, is understanding that, uh, where that he is today. And so someone was praying. The Bible said that the effectual Fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I'm going to tell you something, beloved. Listen, we want to see the old-time services. We want to see old-time revival. We want to see old-time praising and worshiping God. I know there's a lot in this world that's pressing us down. I didn't say you down. I said us down. Amen. But I'm going to tell you something right now. We cannot afford in these days to neglect our prayer closet. We cannot afford, beloved, listen, listen, God's mercy is being magnified in chapter 19 because there's somebody praying in chapter 18. Amen. Listen, I believe it's important. Not only, beloved, listen, do I see in magnified mercy that someone was praying, but I see that someone was pitiful. Now listen, have you ever heard somebody say, so-and-so's pitiful? Or so and so, I've actually said this recently. Some of our people, their health is so broken. I've said they're in a pitiful shape. Amen. I'm telling you, I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. But I'm telling you, there's other ways that the word can be used. Maybe somebody's a drug addict. Or maybe somebody's a sex addict. Or maybe somebody, beloved, listen, is involved in something they shouldn't be involved in. And somebody will say, oh, my son's just in a pitiful shape. Or my daughter's in a pitiful shape. Or, or my brother or my sister or my mom or my dad is just pitiful. I want you to know when I have read and studied Genesis chapter 19, Lot is in a pitiful state. He's in a pitiful state. You say, Pastor, I don't know what you mean. 
Listen, he started out with Abraham. And they got to a place where their cattle was magnified and, uh, and they had more than could just graze. And so they needed to split up. And beloved, there's three things I'm going to give you here today that brought Lot to this pitiful place in this place called Sodom. First of all, it was Lot's choice. Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw the well-watered plain. And the Word of God said he pitched his tent toward Sodom. Lot's choice. I like this. I read it years ago. I'll never forget it. His choice was good for cattle, but it was bad for children. I'm telling you, beloved, there are people in this world today sitting in churches just like this that will make decisions that's good for their finances, whether it's good for their children or not. And I'm telling you, our family ought to come before our finances. Amen. And Lot makes this choice. He pitches his ten. His choice was based on sight and not on faith. God's people are supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. I see, beloved, listen, that he's looking down towards the well-watered plain. He was pitiful in his choices. I, I, I want you to understand, not only was Lot pitiful in his choices, but he was pitiful in his compromise. I'm telling you, beloved, you say, Pastor, how do you know that Lot compromised? Well, he pitched his tent towards Sodom, and he moved into Sodom, and you find him in chapter 19 sitting in the gate of Sodom. Uh, I'm telling you, beloved, just like a town council, amen. Uh, it's a position of authority in that city that God declares was wicked. He compromised. I don't know about you today, beloved, but I'm telling you, compromise is not going to help a church. It's not going to help a family. And let me give you this, it's not going to help a country. I want Brother Richard to pull something up on the screen. I want to show you something here, beloved. I, 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 when I looked at this, I said, I want my people to see this. The question, this is by Gallup. Do you think marriages between same-sex couples should or should not be recognized by the law as valid with the same rights as traditional marriage? If you go back just a little bit before 1997 into 1996, the, the, the red line represents that it should be valid. Is the other one blue? Blue and green. Blue and green. I, now you all know I'm colorblind. I've been telling you that for eight years. Well... To me, it's a red line, but Brother Steve said it's green, so we'll go with Brother Steve. He's not colorblind. So the, the, the green line on the bottom, there was 27% in 1996 said that it should be valid, and 68% said that it should not be valid. Bring that down to 2021, where we are today. You say, Pastor, you're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. No, I'm talking about America now. I'm talking about pitiful. It's pitiful. It's pitiful. It's pitiful that these lines cross one another in about 2011. And now 70% of the people in America say that same-sex marriage should be valid and you should give them the same rights. And only 29% say that it should not be valid. You say, Pastor, what's wrong with you? No, beloved, listen. It's not what's wrong with me. It's what's wrong with us. When are we going to wake up and realize, beloved, listen, we need God's mercy just like they did in Sodom and Gomorrah. Just like Lot did. Thank you, Brother Richard. You can take that down. I appreciate that. I appreciate my brother working with me. When I saw that, Brother Steve, I couldn't believe it. I hope that leaves an image in our mind this morning. I'm going to tell you something right now. If your family has not been touched by the sin of homosexuality and sodomy, I'm telling you you're blessed because many, many, many families, beloved, have been touched. Somewhere there's a brother. Somewhere there's a sister. Somewhere there's a mama. Somewhere there's a daddy. I'm telling you, beloved, it doesn't matter if every family's touched by it. It will never be right in the eyes of God. Never. Pitiful. You say, Pastor, I thought you were talking about Lot being pitiful. 
Yeah, but I'm telling you, I'm talking about mercy. I believe the only reason America has got by this far is there's a merciful God in heaven. I'm telling you, beloved, listen. I wonder, I'd say the chart would be worse than that for abortion. But can I tell you something? God ain't changed his mind about the little babies. It's had to bless you, Sister Tanita, to know that God's in there looking. He's already got his ultrasound going. Amen. He knows what's going on. Amen. You say, Pastor, I, I, I don't know what's the matter with them people in Texas. I'm going to tell you something right now, beloved. Listen, they're fighting. They're a hollering. They're a screaming. I'm going to tell you something right now. We'll never get back to the things of God without some fighting, without some hollering, and without some screaming. But I want to be on the right side. You say, Pastor, how do you know what's right? I'll tell you, this right here is the only way we can know what's right. It's the only way. Someone was pitiful. Beloved, listen, he compromised. Look in verse number seven. I want you to see this. Well, let me, let me read a little bit. Stay with me just a moment. The Bible said here, the men, uh, Lot, uh, he convinced them to come into the house. They didn't want to at first. They said they were going to stay out on the street. These men, they're two angels. They came into the house. But before they lay down in verse four, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, and compassed the house, uh, Sodom, uh, compassed the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. I want you to look at that right there, both old and young. Beloved, there was a time when most of these sinful activities were just happening among the rebellious and among sin, uh, young people. But I'm telling you, not anymore. Somebody say Amen. I'm telling you, beloved, it's old, it's young, it's everywhere in between, amen, sin. It's, it's terrible to be known for a city that's the capital of sodomy. And here, beloved, was a city that God, and not only Sodom, but others as well. Watch this now. And they called unto Lot, and they said unto him, Where are the men which came in unto thee this night? I want you to look at this, please. Bring them out to us that we may know them. Beloved, they didn't want to just know their name. They didn't want to know if it's just good looking or not. You say, Pastor, how can you say that? Read with me. And the Bible said, Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. In other words, he shut the two angels on the inside. He's standing on the outside talking to them. And I want you to see something. I said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Lot knew exactly what they had in mind, amen, uh, for the two angels that was on the inside. What I want you to see in the compromise, look at me, look at me. Lot had the gall to call them brethren. You say, Pastor, where are you going with that? Here's what I'm going to go with that. You don't have to like it, but it's the truth. But let me, let me tell you something right now. A person... I can look it up. I think I have a reference to it later in the message. I'll just go ahead and give it to you over in the book of Corinthians. It talks about effeminate abusers of themselves, mankind. Such were some of you, but you're washed. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said, beloved, listen, in Romans chapter 1, he gave them up. He gave them up, and then the Bible said he gave them over. I believe with all of my heart there is a place in there. Listen, gave them up, gave them up. I believe there's a place in there when God can deal with a man's heart, God can deal with a woman's heart, and they can be saved. But I also believe there's a place in there where you can go too far, and God will give them over. They may live a hundred years, but they'll die without God and go to hell because of the judgment, beloved. Listen, it's too late for mercy. Say, God is a merciful God. First time mercy's mentioned, there's two men, two angels. Got Lot, got his wife, and got his children by the hand and leading them out of Sodom. Beloved, it tells me that it actually had to pull them a little bit here. They were lingering. Amen. I'm going to tell you something right now. You get to lingering too long around sin, you'll fall in. Amen. Watch what the Bible is teaching us here. I said he compromised. He called them brethren. Let me tell you something right now. There's things standing in the pulpit today. 
I'm talking about, beloved, those, listen, listen, that say God has accepted us. I'm going to tell you something about sin. God's never changed his mind about sin. He never will. Your sin or my sin. Your family's sin or my family's sin. Our country's sin or somebody else's country's sin. God has never changed his mind about sin. You say, Pastor, you're talking about this stuff with the babies and, and you're talking about this stuff. Listen, it don't matter if it's drunkenness. It don't matter if it's thieving. It don't matter if it's laziness. It don't matter if it's being disobedient to parents. God has never changed his mind about sin. And he's not going to. He said, I'm the Lord. I change not. The word of God said Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today, and forever. So as we look, we see someone that was pitiful. He was pitiful because of his choice. He was pitiful uh, because of his compromise. But then he was pitiful in his character. You say, Pastor, I don't know what you mean. Listen to me carefully right here. A man's character is in bad shape when he can't speak to his own family without his own family seeming like, him seeming like he's a mockery to his own family. I'll tell you something, that would be a pitiful, pitiful place to be. He seemed as one that mocked. You say, Pastor, what about his character? Look in verse 8. He said, Behold now, he's talking to these men, old and young, that circled the house. And beloved, listen to me. You can take this for whatever it's worth. But I believe right now there's a movement in America and they're circling the house of God. They're just waiting. They're just waiting to pounce on God's people. My wife told us this morning in, in Sunday school that already in Afghanistan, beloved, listen, they're gathering up. I, I told the kids this morning, one of the things they're checking, they're checking your cell phone over there to see if you have a Bible app on it. Listen to me. You say, Pastor, that's over there. You better wake up. You better wake up. It used to be that we could say that was over there in California. But now it's in Johnson City. Now it's in Asheville. Now it's in Kingsport. We better wake up as God's people. We see somebody that's pitiful. You say, Pastor, look at it, verse number 8. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. I'm going to tell you something right now. You're talking about a sad state of affairs. It's when a bunch of old men and a bunch of young men would rather have another man than have two young ladies. Did y'all hear what I just said? But Lot's character stinks. No, leave these men alone. They're my guests. I'm taking care of them tonight. Let me give you my two daughters. You know what I say? Over my dead body. You're preaching on mercy. I'm trying to get you to see what a shape he was in. When God come, Brother Wayne, and got him by the hand and said, get out of this mess. There's a picture being painted here. Beloved, listen, not only is there someone that's praying and someone that's pitiful, but there's someone that was planning. God had a plan. There's a picture being painted here. We're living in dark days. But I'm going to tell you something right now. There's not someone going to come get us by the hand, but there's someone going to step out on a cloud. He said, come up hither. And honey, we're checking out of here. Amen. I want you to know this morning, listen, God has a plan. It may be getting darker by the day and the lines may be crossing and getting worse by the day, but I want you to know this. Uh, they're fixing to cross a line where God's going to say, mercy is gone, mercy is over, and judgment's coming. A lot of people don't even believe it rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. But if you believe the Bible, you believe it. I'm going to tell you something right now. God is going to rain again. Hailstones that weigh 100 pounds in the tribulation. One third of the earth's vegetation on fire. I mean, you get one third of California on fire and they think they got problems. You think about one third of the world on fire. 
You're talking about smoke inhalation. Somebody say amen. You talk about the pestilence in the rivers, uh, in the waters, amen, dead stuff afloating. You talk about one-third of the world, the world's water supply turn into blood. You say, Pastor, where are you going to be when all that's going on? I'm going to tell you where. I'm going to be gone. Hallelujah. I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be with Jesus in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. We may go through some persecution, and personally, I believe we will. We're no better than the early church. But I'll tell you this much right now. We're not going through the great tribulation. We're not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's sad this morning. The people will sit in services just like this and leave this world and die and go to hell, never realizing that God had a plan for your life. God, you say, Pastor, how do you know God wants to be merciful to me? Let me read you a verse or try to quote it. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I lived my life for 27 years unconcerned about God's plan, actually, for about 20 years. And then at, at about 20 years old, I began to get concerned, our first child being born, about God's plan for my life. And I joined up with the church, and I did everything I knew to do in the church. I tried my best to do what was right. I wasn't uh, uh, getting drunk on the weekend, going to church on Sunday. I wasn't doing none of that. I was trying to talk right and walk right and act right and dress right and do what was right. But I tell you, none of that brought peace in my heart, Brother Ed. That peace you talked about a while ago can only come from Calvary. It can only come from the forgiveness and the mercy that Jesus Christ gives us when he births us into the family of God. Many people are religious but don't have a relationship. Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Oh, they know the language. Have we done, done many marvelous works in thy name? Have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? He will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Listen, beloved, that verse is not talking about the sodomites. That verse is not talking about the drunkards. That verse is not talking about the harlots. That verse is talking about people that sit in church every Sunday. And they think they're going to go to heaven, that God's paying attention to their $100 bill or God's paying attention to their $20 bill or God's paying attention to their 10 I'm going to tell you something right now. That's the reason a lot of men have quit preaching. They're paying too much attention to the offering and not enough attention to the Savior. Say amen. I'm going to tell you what. Listen, you want to hurt this pastor? You want to hurt me deeply? I said, do you want to hurt me deeply? Then you go to hell from the pews of Bible Way Baptist Church. You go to hell from this place. Amen. I don't know of anything, Brother Steve, that would hurt worse than to know that we stood and begged and pleaded and preached yeah. and God's mercy was rejected. You say, Pastor, that's not your responsibility. I didn't say it was. I said it'll hurt. There's a reason, beloved, when the saints of God witness the great white throne judgment. There's a reason that right after that, they're cast off into the region of the dam, into the lake of fire. There's a reason that God said, I'll wipe all tears away from their eyes. Brother Grizzle, that missionary that we supported, he's preached his heart out, and yet his people, many of them, will die without God. He'll stand there and weep. I believe with all my heart, God, on this day, in Sodom, magnified his mercy. He's wanting us to see, yes, there's someone here that was praying that was Abraham. There's someone here that's pitiful. And that's Lot. There's someone here, beloved, listen to me, that's planning 
He's not on the scene. He's behind the scene. I wonder. The Bible gives us the record, Brother Steve, of how Abraham's praying about Sodom and its destruction going through the numbers. But Brother David, I wonder how many times Abraham bowed said, oh God, you know my nephew. God, you know that place down there where he's at. God, would you help him? God, would you keep him? God, would you deliver him from that mess? Only God knows how many times Abraham prayed for Lot. You find in the word of God, beloved, listen. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, I'll close with this, ladies, if you want to get ready with a song of invitation. 2 Peter chapter 2. Lot's life was so pitiful that I do not know as your pastor if I could say emphatically that he was a saved man if it weren't for 2 Peter chapter 2. Look what the Bible said in verse 7 and 8. Let me, let me read verse 6 as well. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example. I didn't plan on reading that verse, but God wanted us to read it, didn't he? God's saying, America, I've given you an example. Go ahead and cross your lines. Go ahead and take your poles. Go ahead and say evil's good and good's evil. But I'm paying attention. Our youngins, many of them have gone off to college. And I say this, and I say it respectfully. They need to go to college, especially in the professional realm. But as far as the things of God, God only knows what they're going to be taught. I hope and pray, Brother Steve, they have a sure foundation. That's what you named your class. A place where they could stand rock ribbed with a backbone. When somebody says you came from a monkey and say, no, I didn't. You might have, but I didn't. Amen. Notice what the word of God said. For an example to those that after should live ungodly. And he delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man, Brother Grizzle, I don't know if I could say it for sure if I didn't have that right there. I'm telling you what I see in chapter 19, even when I see when Lot made his choice and he compromised, beloved, it don't point to a Christian man to me. It brings to life another verse of Scripture. At the judgment seat of Christ, some are going to be saved so as by fire. What's that mean? That means they knew Christ as Savior, but they sat on the pew of do nothing. They didn't pray. They didn't study. They didn't witness. They didn't give. Say amen. amen. Saved. So as by fire. In today's vocabulary, we would say by the skin of their teeth. The Bible said, Lot, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Beloved, if you'll come back tonight, I'm not going to tell you exactly what I'll be preaching but we're going to pick up something else here and look at it tonight. I believe with all of my heart, America's in trouble. And if you're paying attention, you know that. Our churches are in trouble. I, I thought it was amazing, beloved. Listen, just think about when COVID first hit, Brother Randall. The church is not essential, but the liquor store is. Now, wait a minute. I'm not a rocket scientist, but what's wrong with that picture? 
And let me, ask, let, me t- let me say this to you. Let's just say Brother Steve and Miss Cindy, they've got a little mom and pop store down here on the corner and they sell groceries. Some, I, I can remember my dad all the time stopping by a place called Birch's and getting bread and milk. We had six youngins in our home. With him and mom, that was eight of us. You had to have bread and milk about every day. Brother Rick, why is it right for Walmart to stay open and he has to shut down? When you're selling, no, he's not selling the beer. Never mind, amen. Basically the same necessities. Why is that right? Why is a government allowed to pick winners and losers? I'm going to tell you something right now, beloved. We're a lot more trouble than we realize. But God is still on the throne. And God, he may have to cut this tree down. But I want you to know something. There's life in the stump. When you get over there to that 29% that that still today say that that's not right, that's probably about where we're at in America, Brother Steve, as far as God-fearing people that believe the word of God. That's probably about where we're at. God help us. If you're here this morning, you're not saved. God help you. Don't turn your back on mercy. God's offering you mercy. He's offering you the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please don't turn your back on him. You never know, beloved, when that is going to be offered the last time. You can be young. You can be old. Read the obituaries. Death is no respecter of persons. It gets the young, it gets the old, it gets everybody in between. The main thing is is to be ready. Be ready. Let's bow for prayer. Ladies, if you'll come, I appreciate that. Father in heaven, thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you know what we need even before we ask. God, those people in Corinthians that were guilty of some horrible sins, Lord, they received mercy. They were justified in the name of the Lord. And Father, may we today realize, Lord, that it doesn't matter how man categorizes sin because, Lord, if we've offended in one point of the law, we're guilty of all. I pray, God, today that someone under the sound of my voice would understand their need of God's mercy. Realize, our Father, that you will be merciful to them. Lord, today I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. There's people here that have already let me know when service has gone by that they don't know Jesus. I pray you'll work in their hearts. I pray, God, you'll work in our hearts as your people. Lord, mercy was shown. Somebody was praying. God, help us to pray for America. Help us to pray for our families. Help us to pray for those that are unsaved. Help us to pray for those, Lord, who in their health are pitiful today, so broken. God, I pray today, help us having done all to stand in these days. In Jesus' name. We're standing together. If you need this altar, beloved, that's what it's here for. Would you come while the ladies sing? Would you trust Jesus today? If you'd like to come and pray for our country, pray for these that are